Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Kyle. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Kyle. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here tonight, um, a sober guy. I um, was separated from alcohol July 17, 2005, and... Um, you know, something happened. It got me, uh, God graced me with this, uh, this new gift, um, getting on a path of, uh, that I didn't know I was going to get on. Um, you know, I, uh, have a sponsor today. Um, I have a working knowledge and practice of the 12 steps. And, uh, I like to think that I live a spiritual way of life. Um, all things that I guess I must do in order to maintain and grow in sobriety. Uh, more importantly than I think a sponsor and attending meetings and having the home group that I have is uh, sponsees in my life and the God of my understanding. Um, that's kind of where I'm at today in my sobriety. Um, you know, today was a day off, so I opened my door and across the kitchen table was a sponsee that I hadn't seen in a while. And, uh, big books were open and, you know, I shared my experience with him. Some of the truths that maybe I'll share with you guys tonight. And, uh, you know, on short notice, here I sit, you know, doing service. And, um, when I first got to AA, I just, I wanted to stop drinking, and um, little did I know what was in store for me. I uh, can think back, and 2005 was a big year in my life. Um, looking back, it wasn't my worst year, you know. Um, I had a bad decade, and uh, it was the kind of culminating part of that decade. And, uh, you know, I... um. I walked into an AA meeting in January and, uh, 2005 and just three guys in a dark basement with tattered steps and traditions on the wall and um, my experience was like I don't, I don't know if I see myself doing this for the rest of my life with these, these guys and uh, little did I know there was a meeting right down the road that was hopping that day. It just wasn't my experience of getting to that meeting when I got there, um, when I got to AA. And, you know, I ended up uh, drinking again, and um, I didn't attend another meeting for about seven months. And uh, a lot happened in that, that period of time. Um, sometimes without these steps, I do believe the clock's ticking. Like, if I'm not living these steps... It's a matter of time before I'm drunk again. And, uh, and I came to the conclusion that we were talking about the jumping off place. And uh, I couldn't see my life with alcohol and I couldn't see my life without it. And um, some of the defining features, as I think it's the first paragraph of We Agnostics, it actually says that I can't seem to control my liquor. And when I start to drink, I have little control over the amount I take. And uh, they say if you answer those questions the way they think that you're going to answer, um, which I I truly believe, like, it says you're probably alcoholic. And I, I had to come to some realizations before I accepted the fact that I was alcoholic and needed to do something about it. Um, you know, it's one thing to, to say you're an alcoholic, but to accept the solution that's offered here takes some, um, take some courage, takes... Um, ego deflation and uh, you know when I first got here I saw the word powerless on on the uh, in the steps and on the on the sheet in front of the room and uh, there was a point in my life I was praying for power like God give me the power to control this thing 
And then I got to AA and I saw the word powerless and I was very confused um, because it wasn't the answer I came up with. And um, at that time, I I thought it meant I, I can't or maybe I won't drink. But then my sponsor that I have currently, he says, no, it really means that you will drink again unless you're living a spiritual way of life. And uh, for me, um, the nature of this beast is that at jail's institution in death that I thought they were just trying to scare me into getting sober about, like I experienced a little bit of all of those in my life. And... Um, Fear will contribute to the fact that I'm sober today, but faith, I believe, is what encourages me to stay sober. Um, I uh, I found myself um, saying another prayer, and it was July 17th. Um, I sobered up in a in a jail cell, and my prayer was a little different. Um, in my prayers in the past, and it was simply, God help me. I can't keep doing this. Can you show me a better way? And before I knew it, like, I call them my angels. Like, there's some angels on this earth that kind of guided me and directed me on the right path. And, um, you know, I ended up, uh, leaving that, that jail cell and, Three days later is when the bed for a rehab opened up. And at that point, um, I hadn't drank in three days and I'm good. I don't need it. And I don't need to go. And, uh, luckily my family was by me and they really encouraged me like you need to. And, um, you know, they stood by me and all the, all the things that I put them through. And uh, I went, and my mind opened up um, ever so slightly, and uh, I still work on having an open mind today, and I truly feel like um, every day is a gift, and uh, what am I choosing, or what am I going to do with that gift? And on a daily basis, you know, I need to constantly think of others. Someone stated to me, even though I'm in my seventh year of sobriety, like, I share this, but I can still be that selfish guy. And uh, today I wrap it up a little nicer. Um, Someone says sometimes I'll put a little bow on that selfishness that I still have. And uh, I work on this on a daily basis, you know. You know, God help me. From being selfish, um, like step six and seven stuff, 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 excuse me. I, um, I was in my, uh, in my second year sobriety, and I was talking about everything I was doing in AA. And, you know, I'm still building on this relationship with God as I understand Him, and, uh, you know, at two years sober, I was going to a lot of meetings, and I had worked the steps, and I was connected with a network of guys, and I ran into some friends, and we went out to dinner, and um, I was telling them how I, w- I was doing a whole bunch of things, and um, I left God out of that picture, and I realized it later, that maybe God wasn't as important or as crucial as she should be, Um, you know, and I left my buddies and I went right to a meeting and uh, shared my experience that I had, you know, and uh, the experience I had was, you know, two years sober talking about what I was doing and, um, you know, I I ended up uh, being in a situation where we went out to eat and I, I was salivating and I'm thinking, what? over a drink and uh I didn't drink but I knew like something was out of balance and uh for some reason like I can get very content and settled you know um I don't call them 
funks, but they're like more like plateaus in sobriety. Like I don't feel the growth. And it was kind of a kickstart to me actually um, getting more involved and looking at the relationship with God that I had um, more seriously. And, you know, I, um, I stayed on the, the course that I, I, I've been on. Um, and I truly believe, like, I've done some work in order to stay sober. But they talk about a dependence and a reliance on God. And um, that's something I need to nurture. They say, too, at some place and some time, like, there'll be nothing between me and a drink except uh, God as I understand him. And how close do I want to get to God in my understanding? You know, do I want to have a close relationship to him? And if I do, like, there's certain things I need to be rid of. And uh, I thought for a long time my problem was alcohol. Then over the course of doing some work with a, an effective sponsor, I realized that self-centeredness was a major issue. And um, like I mentioned earlier, like constant thought of others. Like for a long time, it was like I was the center of my universe, and uh, I hurt some people along the way. And you know, I had to correct that and rectify those things and make amends. And, you know, I truly believe, like, me being a sober guy today is, is my way of making living amends to family, friends, and people I encounter. Um, it's one thing to say, like, I'm a sober guy, but how am I living? And uh, I like to say that at the end of each day, I lived it the best way I actually knew how. And... Uh, the rules for for me and my way of life today is really found in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like I truly believe that's a guide for living. And um, you know, I experienced a, a lot of different things, but um, you know, the more I the more I stay sober, the more I realize the grave nature of this disease. Um, I see guys come in and drink again. I've seen guys had some some knowledge of the program and drink again. And uh, what is that key ingredient? And um, I truly believe like humility is in each one of these steps. <clears throat> like my ego can get really out of whack, and I I think I'm running the show. And when I'm running the show, normally I make a mess of things. And uh, I know for me, um. I couldn't find a substitute for alcohol for a long time. And uh it says the fellowship is the best substitute for alcohol that can be found. And, um, you know, I love the fellowship, I love the service, and I love the unity that occurs here. Uh, for a long time, I... Like I said, I was a selfish guy, even in sobriety. I was four years sober, and um, I had made some moves, you know, and uh, I was sponsorless for a stretch of period of time, you know. Um, I couldn't find anybody to fill the first sponsor that I had. Um, you know, Big Book was attached to his name, and I worked the steps with him in my hometown, and... He was a great guy, helps a lot of guys still. And, you know, when I see him, I thank him for the experience that he allowed me to have. And he says he uh, he didn't do anything, that I did the work. And um, he was just my guide. And after that sponsor, like, I made a move, and I ended up in, in Rockland County, where I am currently. And I actually was approached by a newcomer. And uh, he heard me sharing in a meeting, and he asked me to uh, take him through the work of Alcoholics Anonymous. And at that time, I did not have a sponsor, and I always find the most help from, from newcomers. But he really pushed me to get back into the game. And after that meeting, I went up to uh, one of the guys in my home group at the time, and I asked them if they would sponsor me. And I found a sponsor, and I 
went back to this newcomer and I said, you know, I'd love to work with you. I have a sponsor. And that relationship didn't work the way I thought it was. Um, but it allowed me to get back into that sponsor sponsee relationship. And I need to, uh, I needed to work the steps again. And it wasn't with that individual, but I found someone that I felt he was in meetings pretty much sharing, like, work these steps, pass it on. And uh, at that time, that's what I needed to do. And I worked the steps a second time and had a new experience. And, you know, it was different from my first experience. And, you know, I truly believe, like, I've had a lot of little awakenings throughout my sobriety. Um, and with that being said, like, I started passing this on to other guys. And uh, funny, funny thing is, is I got comfor comfortable for a little while. And like I said, I, I sat back and rested on my laurels. And uh, I'm glad that I had that opportunity to work these steps again. Because I heard a speaker that I respect um, say on this disc that don't rest on a spiritual awakening you had, say, seven years ago. Create a new one. And how do I create new experiences but to sit down and take someone else through this work? And on a road trip I had currently, they... We were talking and pretty much uh, says the steps aren't the work. The steps the preparation for the work. Like, and I truly believe there's times where I'm in the trenches, you know, um, meaning I'm doing service and 12-step work. Um, you know, I've had this experience, and why wouldn't I share my experience with another alcoholic? especially one that's maybe still sick or still suffering or needs a ride to detox or the hospital. Um, and it doesn't necessarily keep it green for me. It's what I need to do, you know, in order to get outside myself, maybe help someone else along their journey. And uh, someone did that for me, and why shouldn't I do that for someone else? And I... Uh, I've had the experience of doing that a few times in sobriety. And I remember one 12-step call I went on, you know, it kind of looked at me and says, why are you here? I said, I'm, I'm here to stay sober and, and maybe help you in the process. And, uh, you know, that's the school of, it's kind of the school that I was brought through. And, uh, you know, to see guys in the grips and, make calls when I don't see them. You know, sometimes we'll get comfortable like seeing people on a weekly basis or a daily basis or whatever. And there's a lot of people in the meetings that um, maybe I don't see for a while. And uh, the concern is, I hope they're okay. Do I wait to see them again or do I send them a text, drop them a call, you know, and check in with them? And... Um, I don't know, I, I do believe that the work's never done here. Like, I need to constantly be doing stuff like that. And, um, and I had the opportunity to work with quite a few guys, and it's definitely the bright spot of my sobriety. Um, you know, the coffee pot and the big books are normally always open and on, and, uh, that's where I'm able to share and feel most connected to to a fellow alcoholic. And I believe that's when my relationship with God is really working, you know, because he allows me to share my experience with someone else. And um, I, uh, I believe today that I wasn't drinking to fill a void or a hole or... I believe my truth today is I was drinking to overcome a craving beyond my mental control. You know? And what's that mean to me today is a little differently than maybe what it meant when I first got here. Um, you know, in the past, 
And I thought I, I drank like I did because I wanted to. And the truth is that I lost the power of choice when it concerns drink. And at the age of 27, you know, on the verge of a heart attack in a hospital. And uh, when I got out of the hospital the next day, my mother said that she thought she was going to lose me. I just said, Mom, it was, it was Friday night, and that's what I do. And it breaks my heart to even think that that's what I said to my mom, you know. And uh, I was suffering from something at that point in my life. And uh, without a drink, like, I was definitely restless, irritable, and discontent. I was, I was an uncomfortable, uncomfortable guy. And the next day when I got out of the hospital, I went back to the same spot I was the night before. I truly believe, like, looking at that example wasn't my choice. You know, like I said earlier, like, I lost that power of choice. And it's almost like that obsession was so great in me. Thought that maybe I could control it or do it differently or, you know, it kind of takes on different different forms in me. And uh, I was going back to the only thing I knew that gave me some ease and comfort. Made me feel like it would be okay. Even though I knew it was, it was killing me and I wasn't living the right way. And uh, I'm glad I had that experience and many others. Um, like some of the worst things that I experienced in my life I would say tragic events like I see even though I struggled for a long time with what's the purpose of this like I truly believe I wouldn't be sitting here a sober guy unless I experienced those things and um, definitely a survivor you know of a few different things in my life and um I um I experienced some things in my life, like even the first time I drank at age 12, uh, I didn't have the control or the power to stop. Um, you know, I got I drank uh, to the point where I needed to be carried out of the place at age 12. Um, And that night, and every time after that, when I drink, I I don't have control. And I see that today. So for me, like, the truth is, like, if I don't have control, like, I need to do things, like I said, on a daily basis in order to maintain and grow so that I have some distance between me and a drink. And um, recently I attended the spiritual breakfast, and... Uh, gentleman said there that he's not an arm's length away, he's 12 steps away. They gave me some comfort in a sense of sense of comfort you know, that I have some tools in my life in order to, you know live a different way of life and I uh, I've been blessed you know, in the fact that I've been sober since the 17th of 2005. Like July was an interesting thing. Something happened, you know, in July to get me to the spot where I guess I needed to drink again in order to stop and um, gain more experience with the fact that I'm a train wreck when it comes to alcohol. And... uh you know, I uh, I love the fact that the fellowship's here because I needed it to be here. And, um, you know, my home group is uh, is a great place. You know, I'm familiar with the people that attend that group. And they almost know me sometimes better than I know myself. And sometimes people see things in me that maybe I don't see in myself. And uh, that's a good thing for me in my life today. Um, 
doing service, etc. The sponsee that came to my house today was riding a bike, go figure, you know. Um, that was my experience as well. And early in recovery, I'm riding my bike like my life depended on it. And I was doing uh, doing a lot for my recovery. I treated it like a job and like it was life or death. And I can remember riding my bike to three or four meetings a day and uh, attending six hours of outpatient a day. And I remember uh, my sponsor at the time, you know, um, telling me, because I told him I would call him every day with all my problems. And he just laughed at me and said, why don't you call someone that needs help? You know, when I told him I was doing a 90 and 90, he asked me what I had going on in my life and why not do 300 and 90. And um, I'm glad I did what I did because uh, I was definitely a sick guy. And um, I needed to experience everything I experienced. And for some reason, I sat in meetings for uh, for a lot of time. And there was one guy, like I said, my first sponsor, who sounded a little different than the other guys in the meeting. And I wondered where he got all his knowledge from, you know. And like I said, Big Book was attached to his name. And it took me a little while to connect the dots, but I did. And um, looking back, and I just think that I needed to experience as many meetings as I did because... Sometimes I sit in AA meetings and I wonder, what is the message of AA? And I might have heard glimpses or seen glimpses of what AA is. Um, but I truly believe, and it says it in one of the prefaces, that the integrity of the AA message is preserved in the text of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, you know, I'm so glad that I had a, a big book sponsor. And I have a big book sponsor today. Um, because the truths I discovered in that big book, you know, have, have set me free. I've gotten to that point where um, I do feel like I'm safe and protected. That's a lot different than guarded or scared or holding on. Sometimes I'll ask guys how they're doing and hanging in there is what I get. And... Uh, there's so much more to sobriety than just hanging in there. And uh, it's definitely um, it's definitely amazing that, you know, a hopeless alcoholic and a real alcoholic can get free from that obsession. I had it lifted with no effort on my own. Um, you know, I say I'm sober by the grace of God and a little work on my part. And a little work is the, the 12 steps and... You know, I do got, uh, and I'm reminded, like, I got a big God. And uh, sometimes I'll sit in meetings and, like, I'll get comparing, like, who's got a better, higher power? <laughs> you know, his is really awesome. Mine's all right. You know, and uh, truth is, is mine, mine keeps me safe and protected. And uh, that's a cool, cool, cool spot to be. And I went home to my home, home, home group up in up in Utica, New York. And, you know, my sponsor brought up the, the topic. And there are a lot of topic meetings up there. And he brought up the topic of how really cool it is to be sober. And uh, sometimes the more sober I get, sometimes the more rigid I can be. And, um, you know, the fact is, like, I need to be open and willing to have an open mind and a willingness to continue doing what I've been doing and uh, then some, you know, and uh, sometimes I forget like the main goal of this is to be a sober guy and um, put a lot of maybe pressure on myself. Am I praying right or am I meditating right? And, and the fact is, is I do. And uh, that's a big step from where I was. And I need to just continue to expand on that. And, you know, I, uh, I remember hitting a meeting back home. 
And uh, it was an 8 o'clock meeting, and, you know, I'm going out for coffee afterwards with some of the people I hadn't seen in a while that I know from recovery. And I ended up giving my mom and dad a call. My dad answered the phone, and I just told him, like, I'm headed out after the meeting I just hit, and uh, I won't be home till till later on. And, you know, he, I told him I didn't want him to worry about me. And the nice thing about my, it might have been different if it was my mom answering the phone, but my dad said, we don't worry about you anymore, Kyle. And it gave me a sense of, like, ease, you know. Like I'm, I'm doing the right thing, and, and I'm on the right path. And I can remember back to like, this might be a little dicey, but six months I'm riding my bike home from some of the meetings in my outpatient, and I ran into a friend that I used to hang out with a whole lot, and he just looked at me. He said, "Kyle, uh, I know where you've been, and I'm proud of you." And it was the first time in a really long time, like, I felt like I'm doing the right thing. And uh, that was a nice thing for him to say and a nice thing for me to experience. And I hadn't heard, like, we're proud of you in a really long time. And um, even though I was told when I went to rehab, like, my parents said, we're proud of you. And I didn't understand it at the time. Um I felt like I was a piece of shit, and uh, look what look where I'm at, and look where my life ended up. And uh, little did I know, is that experience allowed me to have a new beginning. And it wasn't the end of my life; it was just the start of it. And like recovery, um, it's gotten gotten to be really good. Um, I have a lot of true friends in my life, and most of my friends today are in recovery. My coworkers and my family know me as a sober guy, and um, there's a lot of blessings in my life, and it's all because of AA. Sometimes, and I don't have a ton, but I have enough, and... Uh, I remember sitting at my table one time with one of my sponsees, and he he looked at me, and uh, at that time he explained uh, the fact that his God became very thin, green, and fit in his pocket. And uh, you know, it's that finance and romance type of stuff that can get us into sticky situations. And bless you. And he looked around and he just said, you know, this is all because of what you've worked for. And I just said that, you know, this, whatever I have, which I said is enough, is all due to sobriety. Um, and that's my way and my perception of where I'm at. Like, if I'm not a sober guy, like, everything else is going to fall apart. And uh, I'm so glad that I'm able to give back today and do service and at first I thought AA was kind of like I can't believe I ended up here and uh, today I'm thinking like I'm so glad I ended up here and relationship with other alcoholics and recovery and you know sometimes we'll say you know a prayer for the sick and suffering alcoholic and um inside and outside these rooms and you know I sometimes uh, I see people that I think may be untreated and you know I said today earlier to the gentleman I sat down with like you can't apply the solution to alcoholism unless you know what the problem is it's very hard and uh, I spent a lot of time with my guys talking about the obsession the allergy, you know, the phenomenon of craving. And you read the uh, prefaces and the forewords and get into the doctor's opinion and Bill's, Bill's story. And when we go through the rest of that book, and uh, it's amazing what occurs when you go through that process. And 
the realizations that you come to. And I know for me, um, I identify with so much in that, that piece of literature. Um, it's been truly amazing and an awesome experience that they say we, we don't want you to miss. Um, like if you're new or just coming around, like get involved and uh, get an effective sponsor, someone that knows the big book and uh, has experience with alcoholism and recovery. And, uh, you know, they say we're neither cocky nor are we afraid. And um, I love to think that, you know, I'm able to uh, go through life with some ease and comfort. I found that in sobriety. And I'll just close with the fact that I do believe I'm a recovered alcoholic. <coughs> I don't suffer any longer from that hopeless state of mind and body. Something occurred through going through the work that I had an experience with this this thing. And um, we agnostics, there comes a point in that chapter where we really don't discuss alcohol any longer. The rest of the text is about finding a relationship and expanding a relationship with God. And uh, I want to be close to him, not only today, but always. And I need to nurture that, expand it, just continue to stay the course. And uh, I thank you guys for listening tonight. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.